welcome to the Wormhole Podcast, episode 36. I'm very happy to say that joining me today is the author of Bitter Greens, a retelling of Rapunzel, as well as the story of the woman who wrote the original tale. This book won the American Library Association Award for Best Historical Novel of 2015. The other book we will be discussing is The Wild Girl, the love story of Dorton Wilde and Wilhelm Grimm, Dorton being one of the major sources for the Grimm Brothers' tales we now know well. Hello, Kate Forsyth. Hello, Charlie. Thank you so much for having me. How are you? Oh, I'm very well, thank you. I'm speaking to you from beautiful Sydney in Australia, where it's... uh, Turning towards winter, our days are getting shorter and colder, just as your days are getting longer and brighter. They are indeed. You've written an absolute plethora of books. You've got books for young children, you've got pitch books, you've got books for older children and adults. And today we're talking about the two that have been published in paperback in the UK. However, the rest of your books are available. How much does the fantasy and fairy tale genre cross over between the age groups? All of my books draw upon myth and fairy tale and folklore. All of my books draw upon history and true life. I like to think that I do is I kind of spin them into something new. Most of my books I would call historical fiction with a magic realism twist. Some tip a little bit more over into fantasy and some tip a little bit more over into straight historical but they all have something in common, I suppose, which is a fascination with lost stories of women and with the way that ancient tales can still be an enormous wellspring of inspiration and power and knowledge and wisdom for us to draw upon today. I like your description there of historical fiction with a bit of magical in there. Definitely when I wrote fantasy, it it doesn't quite feel correct, but what you said is perfect. That's lovely. You know, what I love to do is I love to draw, you know, different coloured strands together and weave them together and make something new. I think that genre is a way for us to find our readers and a way for our readers to find us, but it isn't a prison. We don't have to adhere to you know very narrow ideas of what a novel can be as a reader who likes reading lots of different books I I like that yes definitely go with it do you have a favorite age group to write for so my favorite age group to write for is adults and my second favorite age group to write for is what we call upper primary here in Australia nine to twelve year olds I do love writing for younger children as well, and I've got quite a few picture books, but I really see my major work as being my work for adults and my work for children. Yeah. Well, we'll move into Bitter Greens because I do have lots of questions. I said before we started recording, I'm I'm hoping that you're going to kind of answer them accidentally because there are so many. Kate, you have a reading for us from Bitter Greens. I do. So before I start, I should perhaps give you a little bit of background. So Bitter Greens, as Charlie said, is an imaginative retelling of the Rapunzel fairy tale, uh, which is interwoven with the true life story of the woman who told the tale. Her name is Charlotte Rose de la Force, and she was a noblewoman at the court of Louis XIV, the Sun King. The story is divided into three narrative voices. I wanted the structure of the book to reflect the most memorable motif of the fairy tale which is of course the the long braid of hair the impossible ladder of hair by which the witch and the prince gain access to Rapunzel when she's locked in the tower now my three points of view are the girl who is my Rapunzel figure whose name is Margarita the witch And then Charlotte Rose, the woman who wrote the tale. The scene that I'm going to read from you today is set in Venice, which is where the witch lives. And this is a scene from her. It's in, uh, I think, May 1508. So very early 16th century in Venice. And my witch is just a young girl and her mother 
has just died. She wants to have revenge upon the man that caused her mother's death. So let me read it to you. I sat there all night, only the stealthy advance of light into the stairwell roused me from my stupor. I rose stiffly, went downstairs and banged on our landlady's door until she got up and opened the door a crack. What do you want? She croaked. I need a witch. Curiosity sparked in her dull brown eyes. She tilted her matted head. It'll cost you. I dug in my pocket for the few scooty I carried on me. She examined them carefully, rubbing her thumb over the edges to make sure they had not been clipped, then told me, Best witch I know is wise Sibella. They say she's a thousand years old and once led a coven of witches in Spain before the Inquisition drove her away. You'd best be careful. If you betray her, she'll tear out your heart and eat it. Wise Sibella sounded perfect. The witch's eyes were black and inscrutable. Her long flowing hair was as white as an old woman's, though her figure was straight and strong, and her dark olive skin smooth and unlined, except for one deep crease between her brows, angling down from the left. It was her mouth that betrayed her. The lips were sunken and puckered, and when she opened them to speak, she revealed only a few broken stumps of teeth. So, child, what can I do for you? The witch said. I want revenge on someone, I answered. Are you sure you want to dabble in such dark matters? Can you not spit in his soup or put a thistle in his shoe? I looked at her scornfully. I want him to suffer forever. Her lip curled in amusement. Powerful black magic, then. You will need to hate him with great intensity. I do. Do you have any money? I did not trouble with the few battered coins I carried in my pocket. I lifted my skirt and unknotted a ruby ring I had tied in the hem of my petticoat. It was the most valuable piece of jewellery my mother had owned. I lifted it against the light to show Sibelia. She raised her left eyebrow, deepening the line at its corner, so I knew how it had been carved into her flesh. You must hate him very much. I do, I repeated. What is your name, child? Sibelia asked. I bit my lip and looked away. We were sitting in her garden at dusk. The air was heavy with perfume from a white hanging flower like an angel's trumpet. Giant moths beat against the lantern strung along the archways of a patio. A thin crescent moon was pinned to the sky above the crooked, tilted roofs of San Polo. I remembered an old story my nursemaid had once told me about the moon and witches. Selina, I answered. A most intriguing name, much more interesting than Maria. I tried hard not to react. How had she known my name was Maria? Most girls in Venice were called that, I told myself and raised my chin. Do you have a last name, Selina? the witch asked. The whore's brat, the bastard, and now the orphan. I shook my head. So when is your birthday? I told her and she said, born under the sign of the lion, most suitable. You should call yourself Selina Leonelli. That's a name with power. Selina Leonelli. It rolled around my mouth like the sweetest of jujubes. I smiled at her and the unfamiliar movement of the muscles around my mouth seemed to tug up my heart from the black pit into which it had fallen. A new name seemed to signal the possibility of a new life. And how do you come to have such a fine ruby, Selina? It was my mother's. Your mother is dead now. Sibelia said it as a statement of truth, not as a question. I nodded. 
and you wish revenge on the man who caused her death. I nodded again. Very well, I'll help you. But if you are caught and charged with witchcraft, you must not mention my name. I won't, I promised. But she gave me that quizzical lift of her eyebrow again and said, no, Selina, you will not, for I shall bind your tongue so that you cannot speak my name, no matter how much you wish you could. So that was the first spell I ever learnt, the binding of a tongue, the binding of another's will. The second spell I learnt was how to drive a man mad by disturbing his sleep with nightmares. This is how you do it. Take a long black candle and a sharp pin. Write your enemy's name along the candle with the pin, driving the letters in good and deep. Bind the candle in the spiny brambles of a blackberry vine. Wrap it in a square of black cloth, along with a handful of grave dirt. I used dirt from the pauper's grave my mother's body was tossed into. So it closed with black thread. On the night of the first full moon, smash the candle as hard as you can with a hammer while chanting, wake with a scream, haunted by dreams, never rest, never sleep, clawed from the deep. Do this for the next three days. Then take the bag, now filled with smashed candle powder, and bury it in your victim's garden, preferably under his bedroom window. Gusto de Gratoni did not have a garden, but I buried it in a topiary spot on his balcony. I took to lurking outside his villa, watching him pacing back and forth across his window when all the rest of Venice slept. By the end of winter, when the streets of Venice were flooded with icy water, Gusto d'Aguatoni had hanged himself from his bedposts. He would have gone straight to the deepest level of hell I know, and there he would suffer for all eternity. And I, I went to live with wise Sibelia to learn her craft. Thank you. What is your general feeling about the witch from Rapunzel? Well, I was first given the grim fairy tales to read when I was a little girl who was sick in hospital. I'd been savaged by a dog when I was only two years old and the injuries were so catastrophic that I spent the next nine years in and out and in and out of hospital. My mother used to keep a book hidden. So if we were rushed to the hospital in the middle of the night, she would grab a book because she knew it was the only thing that would keep me happy. And so books were, I I like to say they were my only source of sunshine, my only solace. When I was seven and rushed to hospital, the book she gave me was this red leather bound copy of the Grimm's Fairy Tales. And all the tales in that book spoke to me very, very powerfully, but it was Rapunzel that was the one that seemed to speak to me most closely. And this is because Rapunzel is a girl who's locked away from the world against her will. You know, she doesn't want to be there. She wants to, to be free, but she's trapped in this place, a place of terror and loneliness and despair. Well, I was a girl who was locked away from the world against my will. I was locked away in a hospital ward. and I was locked away in, in the prison of my own illness, of pain. Trust me, I know what terror and loneliness and despair feels like to be a girl locked away from the world. Now, the reason why I kept being rushed to hospital was because the dog had destroyed my tear duct in my left eye. One of its lower canines had pierced straight through the corner of my eye into the brain and destroyed the tear duct. This meant that I was unable to control my tears. My eye just wept constantly and it was constantly um, getting infected and I'd get a, a condition profound inflammation and high fever as a result. So 
I was made ill because of my inability to control my tears. I don't know how well you remember the story of Rapunzel, but at the end of the book, you know, the prince has been flung down from the height of the tower by the witch and he he falls amongst thorns and he's blinded and he stumbles sightless and bleeding into the world. Rapunzel finds him and then she weeps at the sight of his of his wounds and her tears fall upon his eyes and heal him so he can see again. So my tears blinded me and made me ill and brought me closer to death. Rapunzel's tears were this incredibly powerful force of healing. So as a little girl, this fairy tale, it gave me the hope that one day, like Rapunzel, I would escape my tower. And one day, like Rapunzel, I would be healed. So this is a very long answer to a short question, but my answer to it is, when I was a little girl, I read the story of Rapunzel again and again and again because it brought me hope. And hope is the most important human quality that there is. The hope that we can be changed, the hope that we can escape, the hope that we can be healed, the hope that we can be redeemed. But at the heart of the fairy tale of Rapunzel is this great question, this great mystery or puzzle. Why? Why would the witch lock a girl away from the world? Why would a witch be so cruel? Why would she subject another human to the terror and loneliness and despair of being locked away from the world? It was this puzzle, this question that I couldn't answer as a child that I thought about again and again and again. I first tried to retell the story of Rapunzel when I was 12. And I couldn't answer the question. I didn't understand the witch. And so trying to understand the witch was the core, the mystery that drove me to, to write the 160,000 words that is Bitter Greens. It's very interesting. You've obviously got these three different people literally locked away in their different forms. And then you've got this extra subtext of yourself as a child. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I wrote Bitter Greens as the creative component of a doctorate of creative arts. And then I wrote another book, which is called The Rebirth of Rapunzel, a mythic biography of the maiden in the tower, where I look at the history of the tale. It's actually one of the oldest of all fairy tales. It reaches hundreds, even thousands of years into our human past. And at the heart of it is the motif of the tower. Fairy tales speak to us in metaphor and archetype and symbol. So a tower is not just an edifice of stone that keeps someone imprisoned. It's a metaphor for something else. And for each of the three women in the book, the prison in which they find themselves takes a different form. For Charlotte Rose Dela Force, she is imprisoned in a convent by the king because of her scandalous love affairs and her outspokenness. For Margarita, she's imprisoned in a tower. And for Selena, the witch, well, she's imprisoned in her own pain, but she's also imprisoned in a convent. And so for me, my own prison was at hospital ward. I was the only child in there ever. And also being ill, being in pain and being afraid of the future. But for other people, the tower can be anything. It can be a narcissistic parent that keeps you enslaved. It can be a job that you hate, but you go to because you need to pay the bills. It can be an unhappy relationship. It can be your own fear. The tower metaphorically stands in for anything which ties the human spirit down, which keeps it paralyzed, locked and rusted into place. And so the power of the Rapunzel fairy tale is that one can liberate oneself. One can escape. And that is the hope, is a message of hope that it held out to me as a child and which I now have brought to life, I hope, in this novel, Bitter Greens. Brought to life and then some, I think, definitely, yeah. 
you've mentioned there about your doctorate. What kind of information could we expect from the thesis as opposed to the fiction? So it's like a creative thesis where not only do I look at the history of this one particular fairy tale, right back as far back in deep time as I can go, all the way through to Disney's Tangled. So I look at the way that it was told and retold throughout history and then the way that modern artists reacted to it, starting with William Morris and moving through, you know, choosing six or seven different creative artists. But woven through this examination of the history of the tale, I weave through my own life story. I weave through my own personal interpretation and responses to the tale. And I weave through ways of reading and understanding one particular fairy tale, but as a a microcosm to understand the purpose and meaning of fairy tales in general. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this book is available to purchase, which I was absolutely thrilled about. I've got it on my list. And uh, listeners, I'll include a link to that as well in the episode description. There are obviously many versions of Rapunzel, Why did you choose Charlotte Rose's specifically? And it's a really, really good question. So when we examine fairy tales, we come to understand that there are many different versions of them, sometimes hundreds of different versions for them. But at some point in time, one particular version is crystallized, becomes the the one that most people know and understand to be the true story. Now, earlier versions of Rapunzel had different endings and different ways of being in the story. So, for example, in 16th century Venice, a man called Jean-Baptiste de Basile wrote a version which is called Petrocinella, which means little parsley. And in his version, the girl, Petrocinella, is um, locked away from the world by an ogress. And the girl learns to use her magic against the ogress and escapes. And then we have what's called a magical flight where she and the hero are chased by the witch. You know, the witch turns herself into a bear and into a lion and the girl flings back magical objects that turn into barriers. So this is a very different ending to the one that most people would recognise as being the story of Rapunzel. Most of us know the story in which the girl is imprisoned in the tower and then she sings with all of her might and she draws the prince to her and then the prince climbs up the braid of hair and the two fall into love. But then the girl betrays herself to the witch and is cast out into the wilderness and then the witch cuts off her braid of hair with an enormous pair of shears or scissors and then she hangs the braid down the side of the tower and the prince calls Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair so I might climb the golden stair. And when he climbs up to the top of the tower height, the witch says to him, you thought to find your pretty bird, but she has flown and now I shall scratch out your eyes. And she flings the prince down and he's blinded amongst thorns. And on we go with the motif of the healing tears. Now for me, that was a Rapunzel I wanted to retell because that motif of the healing tears was so important to me. The message it gave me, that the possibility of healing and escape was so powerful. So I wanted to use that story, not any of the other many versions that came before it and not any of the ones that came after it, So when I first started planning Bitter Greens, I imagined writing a story about a woman who told the story, her story, to the Grimm brothers, because I thought that Rapunzel was a Grimm brothers. But as I did my research, I, of course, discovered it was much, much older, and I discovered that the author of the story that we know of as Rapunzel, the crystallised pattern of action that includes the motif of the healing tears and the birth of their children was written by Charlotte Rose de la Force. And as soon as I discovered her, and as soon as I read her life story, I was electrified because Charlotte Rose de la Force is one of the most fascinating women ever forgotten by history. And it was astounding to me that everyone knows the names of Charles Perrault, 
and the Brothers Grimm and Hans Christian Andersen and Oscar Wilde and Andrew Lang and all the male retellers. But the original women who told these tales have been forgotten and that just lit a fire in my belly. I was determined to, I say I rescued Charlotte Rose from the oubliette of history because when I began writing my story about her, if you Googled her name on the internet, you could find two or maybe three mentions, one of which was a Wikipedia entry in French. And now if you Google her name, there are millions of hits. I'm very proud of that. Oh, yeah, you should be. I mean, that's interesting to hear your answer because, uh, I mean, I see from the, the second part, if we save your answer, your passion there, you can see so much passion in your book. And I had wondered if the initial idea had been Charlotte Rose herself. Are there any other stories by Charlotte Rose that we still know today? So she is not very well known. Only one of her other stories has been translated into English, and that is a story called La Bonne Femme, or The Good Woman. And Jack Sipes includes that story. He's got a, a book called Spells of Enchantment, the, the great Western fairy tale tradition, and it's one of the stories included in that. I have woven a number of her stories into the text, and I had to get a copy of her fairy tales, which were published in the 17th century, in 1697. I had to get a copy of that and then have them translated from 17th century French into English. My translator had never had such a difficult job because the text, all the S's look like F's, all the printing, a lot of the words were archaic and were no longer used. It was a really difficult translation job. You know, there are moves now. There have been books published since Bitter Greens that either tell some of her fairy tales in summary or which include extracts from her fairy tales. But I would love to see some of her other fairy tales retold. You know, one of her stories was retold by Andrew Lang, and I retell that story, The Rainbow Prince, in one of my, of my collections of retold fairy tales, of which... Um, I've got three published and the fourth is coming out in a couple of months. Well, you've mentioned you've got a translator there for the book. You keep detailed notebooks for your research. I do. People find my notebooks absolutely fascinating because of the way that I work. So I love a beautiful notebook. I'm always buying them. I don't think that there's a writer alive who doesn't love stationery. I keep a record of every thought every question, every problem, every idea, every sentence. They are a record of my creative processes. I stick maps in them and images in them. I have a very visual imagination. So, for example, with Bitter Greens, I might have had a map of Paris in 1697 so I could see which way Charlotte Rose might have walked. My research is very intense and very deep. Um, and it's kind of like a, a method of, I call it method writing. So I cook the meals that my characters eat. I listen to the music that they would have listened to. I read the books that they would have read. I learn the dances they might have danced. It's a way of embodying the life that I'm recreating on the page. And my notebooks, which because I, I write in them longhand nearly every day, they show every every problem, every challenge, every moment of despair. <laughs> They're not necessarily pretty because they can seem quite chaotic, but that's one of the reasons why people love them so much. I'm always being asked to bring my notebooks along and have them like an art installation where people can read them, look through them, touch them, examine them, see the nerves and sinews and muscles that lie beneath the perfect skin of the text. And that is what people find fascinating, is the transparency, the honesty of the creative process. Well, I can see it helps with the factor of not making writing seem so daunting. At the same time, I suppose it could help it make it seem daunting. But that's fascinating. You, you cook the meals, you learn the dancing. That is just so in-depth. I don't think I've heard anything quite so in-depth. And I'm kind of thinking it'd be lovely to have your 
research notes published somehow. People often ask me that. People ask me if it would be possible to have my notebooks in, in published form, but it would be incredibly expensive because they're so big. And they're all like, you know, I use all different colours. Different characters have different colours assigned to them and different parts of the books. They're a mess. They're almost incomprehensible. You know, sometimes I let people study them if they're writing their thesis on me. I give them access to my notebooks. But in general, it would be very expensive to produce all those images and scraps of poems and everything that I paste into my notebooks. Maybe one day a publisher will be bold enough to do it. A multimedia publication. In the book's notes, you talk about how we don't know much about Charlotte Rose and how she knew about the earlier version, the Perrault version of the story, as it wasn't translated after her death. No, no. So Charles Perrault was her her contemporary. She knew him. Um, He was a friend of hers. Charles Perrault's stories were actually published after Charlotte Rose did her forces. It was a matter of seven months after. Her book was published in early 1697 and tells... From the Mother's Goose was published in late 1697. So it was Jean Baptiste Basile, the story of Petrosinella that I told you earlier. He was actually an Italian, and his stories were told in the original dialect of his homeland. It was never translated either into Italian, translated from a Neapolitan into Italian or into French, and yet. In 1697, we have this astonishing flowering of retellings, stories that carry within them echoes of his tales. So Charles Perrault, for example, drew upon a Basile tale with Sleeping Beauty, Sleeping Beauty in the Wood. Basile's story was very different and much darker and much crueler, but Perrault had obviously read a version of it. How did you know, Charlotte Rose of Force and the other fairy tale tellers of 17th century, the French royal court. How did they come upon these stories? That's a mystery. No one knows the answer. The probability is that a copy of his book was brought to the French court. We certainly know that Charlotte Rose de Force spoke Italian. She puzzled through the Neapolitan dialect and worked it out, but we don't know. It's a mystery completely different kind of question what do you think of Tangled? I love Disney I love the way that they take old tales and they re-spin them and they make them new and they make them delightful I do have a few a few problems with the way that they do it I mean I thought Tangled was warm funny delightful shallow predictable and didn't really have any of the charge of power that the original tale has. Rapunzel is kept in this tower, but instead of it being a single room where she must beat her fist against the wall in her desperate desire to break free, it's a mansion. You know, she can swing about it and she she has every comfort and every luxury any girl could want. And then when she decides that she's going to break free because her mum's a, you know, a narcissistic control freak, it's like a teenage girl sneaking out the bedroom window. It's so easy. She abseils out on her hair. The only thing that kept her within that tower was obedience. And there's nothing about the terrible danger and the possibility of falling to one's death, the fact that the only thing that you have to get out of your tower is your own hair, the pain, the terror. None of that is contained in that story. And then the actual struggle, Rapunzel is a metaphor for a young woman finding the courage to break free and to choose her own life and to live and to grow up. And Rapunzel is this incredibly powerful figure of redemption. She saves the prince and she saves the witch in the version by Charlotte Rose de Force. There is none of that entangled. I feel it's a really lost opportunity to have actually perhaps have had some of the depths and some of that kind of mythic power in the tale. But, you know, it's warm, it's funny, it's romantic. It has um, a great deal of visual beauty to it. And it's aimed for a very young audience. Rapunzel, of course, was never meant for babies and toddlers. 
it's a story about a sexual awakening of a young woman. It's not meant as a bedtime story. And so they've taken a very ancient and powerful tale of desire and power and control and madness and love and they've crammed it into a story about a girl sneaking out behind her mum's back to go out with a cute boy. Mm. Yeah, that, that's interesting to hear your opinion on it, definitely. So if we move on to The Wild Girl, should we start with your reading? Sure. The Wild Girl is the story of Dorchen Wild, which is spelt wild and means wild, but is just pronounced Wild in the German. She was a young woman who grew up next door to the Grimm brothers in Kassel, a small town in Hessen Castle. She was one of the primary sources of of the Grimm Brothers fairy tales. You know, their famous, you know, their first collection, which was published in 1812, Dorchen Wild was the primary oral source of more than a quarter of all the 88 tales in that book. Now I first read about Dorchen Wild when I was researching Bitter Greens um, because I began with this idea of a young woman or an old woman telling her story to the Grimm brothers. I left that idea behind me as as I did my research but this idea of telling Dorchen's tale stayed with me all of that time. I had to wait seven years before I could get to her. Now I'm going to read to you the opening few pages. It's the prologue and let me read it to you. Wild by name and wild by nature, Dorchen's father used to say of her, he did not mean it as a compliment. He thought her headstrong, and so he set himself to tame her. The day Dorchen Wild's father died, she went to the forest, winter bare and snow frosted, so no one could see her dancing with joy. She went to the place where she'd last been truly happy the grove of old linden trees in the palace garden. Tearing off her black bonnet, she flung it into the tangled twigs and drew off her gloves, shoving them in her coat pocket, holding out her bare hands, embracing the cold winter wind. Dorchen spun alone among the linden trees, her black skirts swaying. Snow lay thick upon the ground. The lake's edges were slurred with ice. The only colour was the red rose hips in the briar hedge and the golden windows of the palace. Violin music lilted into the air and shadows twirled past the glass panes. It was Christmas Day. All through Castle, people were dancing and feasting. Dorchen remembered the Christmas balls Jerome Bonaparte had held during his seven-year reign as king. A thousand guests had walked till dawn, their faces hidden behind masks. Willem I, the Kerfurst of Hessen, had won back his throne from the French only a little over a year ago. He would not celebrate Christmas so extravagantly. Soon the lights would be doused, and the music would fade away, and he and his court would go sensibly to bed to save on the cost of lamp oil. Dorchen must dance while she could. She lifted her black skirts and twirled in the snow. He's dead, she sang to herself. I'm free. Three ravens flew through the darkening forest, wings ebony black against the white snow. Their haunting call chilled her. She came to a standstill, surprised to find she was shaking with tears as much as with cold. She caught hold of a thorny branch to steady herself. Snow showered over her. I will never be free. Dorchen was so cold that she felt as if she were made of ice. Looking down, she realized she had cut herself on the rose thorns. Blood dripped into the snow. She sucked the cut and the taste of her blood filled her mouth, metallic as biting a bullet. The sun was sinking away behind the palace and the violin music came to an end. Dorchen did not want to go home, but it was not safe in the forest at night. 
she picked up her bonnet and began trudging home to the rambling old house above her father's apothecary shop where his corpse lay in his bedroom, swollen, stinking, waiting for her to wash it and lay it out. The town was full of revelers. It was the first Christmas since Napoleon had been defeated and banished. Cow singers in long red gowns stood on street corners, singing harmonies. A chestnut seller was selling paper cones of hot chestnuts to the crowd clustered about his little fire, while potmen sold mugs of hot cider and mulled wine. All the young women were dressed in British red and Russian green and Prussian blue, trimmed with military frogging and golden braid, a vast change from the previous year when all had worn the high-waisted white favoured by the Empress Josephine. Dorchen's severe black dress and bonnet made her look like a hooded crow among a vast flock of gaudy parrots. At last she came to the Mart Gasse, lit up with dancing light from a huge bonfire. Not one building matched another, crowded together, all higgledy-piggledy around the cobblestone square with its old pump and drinking trough outside the inn. Only the apothecary's shop was shut, was dark and shuttered. No welcoming light above its door. Dorchen made her way through crowds buying sugar-roasted almonds, gingerbread hearts, wooden toys and small gilded angels at the market stalls. She slipped into the alley that ran down the side of the shop to its garden, locked away behind high walls. Dorchen! A low voice called from the shadowy doorway opposite the garden gate. She turned, hands clasped painfully tight together. A tall, lean figure in black stepped out of the doorway. The light from the square flickered over the strong, spare bones of his face, making hollows of his eyes and cheeks. I've been waiting for you, Wilhelm said. No one knew where you had gone. I went to the forest she answered. Wilhelm nodded. I thought you would. He put his arms about her, drawing her close. For a moment Dorchen resisted, but she was so cold, so tired, she could not withstand the comfort of his touch. She rested her cheek on his chest and heard the thunder of his heart. A ragged breath escaped her. He's dead, she said. I can hardly believe it. I know. I heard the news. I'm sorry. I'm not. He did not answer. She knew she had grieved him. The death of Wilhelm's father had been the first great sorrow of his life. He and his brother Jacob had worked hard ever since to be all their father would have wanted. It was different for Dorchen, though. She had not loved her father. You're free now, he said, his voice so low it could scarcely be heard over the laughter and singing of the crowd in the square. Dorchen had to look away. It doesn't change anything. There's nothing left for me, not a single coin. Wouldn't Rudolph? Dorchen made a restless movement at the mention of her brother. There's not much left for him either. All the wars, and then my father's illness? Well... Rudolph's close to ruin as it is. There was a long silence. In the space between them were all the words Wilhelm could not say. I'm too poor to take a wife. I own so little at my job at the library. I cannot ask Jacob to feed another mouth when he has to support all six of us. The failure of their fairy tale collection was a disappointment to him, Dorchen knew. Wilhelm had worked so hard, pinning all his hopes to it. If only it had been better received. If only it had sold more. I'm so sorry. He bent his head and kissed her. Dorchen drew away and shook her head. I can't. We mustn't. He gave a murmur deep in his throat and tried to kiss her again. She wrenched herself out of his arms. Wilhelm, I can't. 
It, it, it hurts too much. He caught her and drew her back, and she did not have the strength to resist him. Once again, his mouth found hers. She succumbed to the old magic. Desire quickened between them. Her arms were about his neck, their cold lips opening hungrily to each other. His hand slid down to find the curve of her waist, and she drew herself up against him. His breath caught. He turned and pressed her against the stone wall, his hands trying to find the shape of her within her heavy black gown. Dorchen let herself forget the dark years that gaped between them, pretending that she was once more just a girl, madly in love with the boy next door. The church bells rang out, marking the hour. She remembered she was frozen to the bone and that her father's dead body lay on the far side of the wall. It's no use, she whispered, pulling herself out of Willem's arms. It felt like she was tearing away living flesh. Please, please, Willem, don't make it harder. He held her steady, bending his head so his forehead met hers. Our time will come, she shook her head. It's too late. Don't say that. I cannot bear it. Dorchen, it'll never be too late. I love you. You know that I do. Some day, somehow we'll be together. She sighed and tried once more to draw away. He gripped her forearms and said in a low, intense voice, I've been reading novelists. Do you remember? He said the most beautiful thing about love. It's given me faith, Dorchen. What did he say? she asked, wanting to believe, if only for a minute. Love works magic, Wilhelm said. It is the final purpose of the world story, the amen of the universe. She caught her breath in a sob and reached up to kiss him. For a long moment, the world stilled around them. But then the bonfire in the square flared up, sending the shadows racing away. Dorchen stepped back. I must go. There's a bit of everything in your story in the intro, I think. It kind of gives you a good summary for what's going to happen. You created quite a bit of the story yourself. Dorchen's life is invisible to us. There was no records of her birth or her christening because only the births of boys were, were recorded in Germany at that time. I mean, Germany didn't actually exist at that time. This is pre Union of the German States. But girls, their births were not recorded. Only a few of her letters and things in her own hand existed. And not only Dorchen, but women of the time were generally voiceless. To try and discover Dorchen's voice, I was reading all these memoirs and letters of young women, young German women of the time, but they were all educated, upper class women. And Dorchen, of course, was not. She was the daughter of an apothecary. She would have probably gone to school to the age of 12. She would have been taught to count and to read her Bible. And she would have been taught her catechism. But she would not have been you know, very literate at all. In fact, what's really interesting is only three books were allowed in the Veeld household. And one was the Bible and one was a book of sermons, and the other one was Captain James Cook's account of his journey to Australia. And me being Australian, I just thought that was extraordinary, that Dorchen Field was reading about Australia and James Cook's adventures, and I was now writing about her. So what we know of Wilhelm and Dorchen Grimm is we know that they first met when Dorchen was 12, that the Grimm family, and there were six children, five boys and one girl. The Grimm brothers moved in next door to the the Wild Sisters because in the Veald family there were six girls and one boy. They lived their childhoods next to each other. We know that Dorchen had a major crush on Wilhelm as a child because her best friend was Lottie Grimm. Dorchen and Lottie were born on the same day though that wasn't known until I found out. And the only letter that still exists in Dorchen's hand, or one of the only ones, was written to Lottie, where she talks about how much she likes 
Wilhelm and how she wouldn't mind holding his hand. It's really cute. She was about 14. We know that there was a romance between them and that they wanted to marry and Dorchen's father forbade her to marry him and that their romance founded. We know that while they were falling in love, Dorchen told him some of the most extraordinary fairy tales in the world, stories like Wild Swans and Hansel and Gretel and The Frog King, The Elves and the Shoemaker and many, many more. I've used those tales all through the book. We know that they were uh, estranged and yet they came back together again and married much later. We know that the first collection of fairy tales by the Grimm brothers was a flop, both critically and commercially. It sold only 197 copies and they didn't earn a single penny for it because there was no royalties or advance. We know that they bought out other collections of fairy tales, which also sold very, very poorly. And so the first one came out in 1812, when Wilhelm was in his early 20s and Dorchen was 18. And that in 1825, Wilhelm on his own, and with Dorchen's help, selected 25 of the best stories. With Dorchen's help, Wilhelm rewrote them. He dropped all the footnotes and all the scholarly interjections and he no longer tried to keep them um, as close to the oral version as possible. And it was published in 1825, illustrated by his brother Ludwig, and it was a runaway bestseller. And Wilhelm was only then able to afford to marry. This was 13 years after he and Dorchen first wanted to marry. It's a very long time to keep sexual tension humming through a book, 13 years. That was a great challenge of writing The the Wild Girl. I picked up when you say about how the Grimm brothers had to change it and they changed it to more of a children's collection. That's exactly right. So the first few editions, which were published in 1812 and 1814, and then later collections as well, they were written for a scholarly audience They included pages and pages of footnotes and attributations and analysis of the tales. And to begin with, the Grimm brothers were recording oral versions of the tale. So they were quite flat and there was often no narrative coherency. The logic of the story often failed because that's what happens when non-professional storytellers repeat tales. They forget bits and they often confuse two stories together and other problems. In 1824, two English lawyers actually brought out an English translation of the Grimm fairy tales. They translated them quite loosely, so they translated and rewrote them, and they brought them out, these beautiful illustrations by George Cruikshank. And that book, which was called, I think, German Tales, was a runaway bestseller in England. They retold them for children. So they stripped out the sex and the violence and the darkness, and they introduced humour, rhythm and romance. And, of course, the Grimm brothers didn't earn a penny from that either because there was no international rights laws in 1824. But seeing someone else make a fortune out of his stories, and when he was so, so desperately poor, At that time, the Grimm brothers were burning furniture so they didn't freeze to death in winter. They often had a single heel of bread was their only supper between the six members of the family. They were desperately, desperately poor, living under French occupation, under the rule of Napoleon Bonaparte's brother, Jerome. And so he and Dorchen together had this idea of retelling the stories for a childish audience. We don't know how much Dorchen how much input she had. We know that she contributed a few rhymes and we know that because we have his diaries and letters that show us that he was sending her stories to get her feedback. But that was what changed everything for the Grimm Brothers. It was at 1825. It's called the small edition because it's only a limited number of stories and each story has been made shorter, sweeter and simpler. Now, the Grimm Brothers didn't acknowledge any of their sources They didn't say who told them the story. 
But Wilhelm went through and he wrote a name next to many of the stories. You have this faded ink in Wilhelm's own handwriting and it says Dorchen, 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 again and again and again. And that to me was incredibly powerful and moving, partly because no one had actually ever really done an account of where the stories came from. And so I hadn't realised how many stories she'd actually told him. Then the other thing that Wilhelm did that was incredibly useful for me is many of the names he wrote would just be something like Marie or Gretchen or Jeanette. These are the names of some of the other female oral sources of the fairy tales. And that was all. But next to Dorchen, he would write, he would often write the date that she told in the tale and where they were. And at that time, Dorchen was sneaking out and telling him stories against her father's instructions, which was a very wild, bold thing for a girl to do in 1810 and 1811. And so we know, for example, that she told him three stories, three extraordinary stories. One afternoon, it was the 10th of January, 1810, they were in her sister's summer house. Now, January is winter in Germany, and that particular winter was a very fierce, cold winter. And so Wilhelm and Dorchen were hiding out in a summer house in a garden. She was telling him stories with no one knowing. I, I found that amazing and wonderful. And, of course, it really helped me in building the stories and working out what stories she told when. So, first of all, I... I established a timeline of what was happening in Dorchen's outer world, you know, the invasion of the Grand Army of Napoleon and living under occupation and Napoleon being overcome and imprisoned, all the external events. But I had nothing for what was happening in her life until I saw this hand exemplar and I was able to build a timeline of when she told what story and where she was when she told it. And then I had to build another timeline. I had to understand her inner life. And that's where, of course, my imagination comes into play. I would try and understand why a young woman, she was only 17, 18 and 19, why she would tell a young man this type of story on this type of day, what it might have meant to her. Um, and that is where my imagination really came into play, trying to understand the inner life of this young woman interesting that it was obviously important to Willem to record who told him the tales and yet I suppose uh, historically we can understand it in that context that they were excluded from the print. Yes the idea was that they were recording the tales of the folk of the folk um, and, they, and they often had many different versions of the same story so, so we know that um, Hansel and Gretel for example was a tale that was told by someone in the Wild family most people think it was Dorchen, but we don't know for sure. But we also know that different versions of the same tale were told to Wilhelm by other people, and then he ended up combining them to make one story. So because sometimes they had many different sources for the same tale and the stories had different versions, the Grimm brothers made the editorial decision not to name their sources, but just to record the story and then to look at its history and its influences and kind of scholarly way. Now, nowadays, with our understanding of the ownership of stories, this seems a terrible thing to us. But at the time, it was a norm. And there was no sense that the stories belonged to anyone. They belonged to the folk. And that's what they were. That was their aim. However, Wilhelm's feelings towards the stories changed as time went on because often the stories weren't very good. And so he rewrote them and he actually, um, you know, usually made them better. Well, with all that said, it's lovely that you have brought a few of the sisters and the servant who's a possible source and things like that to the fore. Yeah, the catch of Old Marie was one of the most difficult choices to make. So when Wilhelm and Dorchen were both dead, and people asked their son, Herman, about where the stories came from. He said, oh, well, my mother told many of the stories to my father. So my mother was the source of many of these stories. And then they said, but who told your mother? And he said, well, their old serving woman, 
who was called Old Malie. And in the hand exemplar, written next to many of the stories, is the name Marie. And so most people thought that meant all the stories were told by Old Marie. But research by later scholars have shown that in actual fact, many of the stories came from a young woman whose name was Marie Hassen, Hassenflug. And she told the Briar Rose, for example, which is, of course, Sleeping Beauty. And so the idea of Old Marie fell out of favour. But one of the problems, of course, is that some of the stories said to have been told by Marie were told to Willem before he met the Hassenflugs. And so it seems as if there was more than one Marie. So if I had been writing a non-fiction book, I could have discussed this. I could have said, you know, some scholars believe in the old serving woman, Marie, who told Dorch and her tales. And some people believe that she was not the source of the tales and it was this young woman who came from French Huguenot background. And we have no way of knowing because the Grimm brothers did not record the sources of their tales. But writing a novel, I can't do that. I have to choose. I have to make my decision. And so I made the creative decision to have Dorchen being told many of her tales by this old serving woman. Now, we know certainly that some of the tales would have been told to her by old Marie but maybe not all the ones that I attributed to her. I have no way of knowing. I had to make an executive decision. And that's part of the challenge of being a creative artist and not a historian. How much time did you have to spend researching the Napoleonic Wars? Well, the research for The Wild Girl was very difficult, was very intensive. And there are a number of different reasons for that. One is because I knew nothing about the Napoleonic Wars. I studied history at school and at university, but we ended with the French Revolution. And then we began again with World War I. We kind of jumped from the 18th century to the 20th 20th century. And so I never understood Napoleon or how a Corsican peasant became emperor of the world. So I had to read an awful lot about Napoleon and Napoleonic times. Can you tell us about the treatments for asthma in the early 1800s? Yeah, absolutely. So this is the beautiful thing about research, what you discover. So Wilhelm um, had always been a sickly child with a lot of breathing difficulties, which we would now call asthma. Um, and also he was prone to, in the winter, colds and bronchitis and things like that, which is a kind of side effect of asthma. In the early 19th century, not much was known about how to treat asthma and some of the medical treatments were appalling one for example was to breathe in the fumes of mercury now we all know now of course about how dangerous mercury is particularly the fumes of it we know that mercury is highly poisonous and that one of the side effects of breathing mercury fumes is of course breathing difficulties but it also causes delirium and even madness so the, the mad hatter in Alice the Wonderland, hatters of the time were said to be mad because they worked so much with mercury in their work and it caused insanity. So we know from your mentioning a bit earlier that you have a, another collection of stories coming out soon. And I think we need to talk about this one. You have writing retreats in the Cotswolds every year. Oh, I love them so much. So every year, not this year and not last year but every other year I want to it's a combination of a writing retreat and a literary tour so we have a group of people usually about 10 we began staying in Broadway in the Cotswolds but now we are centered in Stratford-upon-Avon we have a writing class every morning so that's seven classes and then every second afternoon we do a tour to somewhere magical and mysterious and of historical interest in the area so you know we go to the roll right stones which is a circle of neolithic standing stones in a farmer's field you know i just love it it's like a little miniature stonehenge but it's open it's free and you can you can walk around it, you can picnic there, you can touch the stones, you can climb on the stones. 
um, you know, we go to a medieval castle, we do a walking tour of Stratford-upon-Avon and we do a walking tour of Oxford. We go and see a play, the Royal Shakespeare Theatre. We eat at the very best restaurants and we choose ones that are farm to the table. So we're eating food that was grown in the Asian Vale, for example. On our final night, we have a farewell feast in a haunted castle and tell ghost stories. It's wonderful. (laughs) I love it so much. I have writers who have never written very much at all. And I have writers who have been writing and publishing for years, but have lost their sense of wonder, their sense of purpose. It sounds absolutely excellent. And um, I mean, obviously, the world is in chaos at the moment, so things might change. But what are the current plans for dates for next year? If all goes well, we'll be doing the retreat again in midsummer. So in you know the final week of June. It's an, an international course. And so I've had people from Australia, from Malaysia, from America, from Ireland and from Britain. And so it's open to anyone who pleases. And the other thing that's really, really beautiful about it is that the people who come on the retreat make the dearest of friends and they often maintain those friendships over years and years and years. And we have a high rate of publication. Former students of mine have agents and have been published and have film deals and all sorts of exciting things. Um, And that gives me so much pleasure and see them building a lifetime of creative practice out of it. Well, if you are interested, the info is on Kate Forsyth's website, which is going to be linked in the show notes as well. So, listeners, links to purchase Bitter Greens, The Wild Girl and The Rebirth of Rapunzel, all these links can be found in the episode description. If you have enjoyed our conversation, do subscribe or follow for future episodes. Kate, this has been absolutely incredible having you on. I have been looking forward to it and really, really enjoyed rereading your books. Your knowledge is absolutely out this world. It's fascinating. There's just so much there. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me and I hope that you have the most glorious day. The next interview will be on Monday the 10th of May. The Wormhole Podcast, episode 36, was recorded on the 14th of April and published on the 26th of April, 2021. Music and production by Charlie Place.